welcome to a very special episode of Monster Kid Radio, special for a few different reasons, one of them being that uh, I don't have my main computer. It is MIA, hopefully not KIA, that has been spending the past few nights over at a friend's house trying to get reanimated, resuscitated, and restored. Dr. Doffelstein, our friend Tom, has it in his capable hands right now, and he's trying to res- uh, restore everything, save everything, that sort of thing. Because we don't have the main computer, you're not going to get a regular episode of Monster Kid Radio with all the bells and whistles, but I'm going to do my absolute best. Fortunately, most of this week's content is provided by, well, some of the contributors. we got Mark Matsky's Beta Capsule Review, but he also sent in a whopping 30-minute-plus long recap of Monster Bash. How cool is that? Mark, thank you. So you're going to hear that, and of course you're going to get Kenny's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. So that's coming up here as well. So you've got a lot of Mark, a little bit of Kenny, and you are going to get me and Beth because I turned on the recorder on the way home from our job at the Haunted House at Scaregrounds PDX just a couple of days ago. It was a Wednesday night. So we recorded for about 15 minutes or so in the car on the ride home and talked about how the Haunted House is going as well as about some other some, some other pretty cool stuff, which also makes this episode extra special. If you follow me on Facebook and Instagram, you know what I'm talking about. We'll talk a little bit about that here on the podcast as well. You'll hear that here shortly. Uh, you're not hearing anything uh, from a surf band. You're actually hearing the Monster Kid Radio, basically what I call the theme song, the uh, theme music that we use here on the show. So you're hearing that right now. We're going to fade away from that, get into the Beta Capsule Review, We'll get into, uh, let's see, probably do the Famous monster segment next, then the Monster Bash recap, and then you'll hear from me and Beth. Oh, and we might even have some feedback. I think I have a voicemail I'm sitting on. Why don't we get to that next? Hey, Derek. Hey, group. Captain Billy here, calling from the uh, south shore of Lake Erie. You remember, our Lake ain't superior, but it is Erie. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, Mask of the Mask of uh, Mask of Fu Manchu. Sorry. Um, yeah. Oh, I just saw this. Maybe uh, Jesus, October, probably September, August. I just saw it. I have the. Uh, let's see. Hold on. I have it right in front. Oh, I didn't have it in front of me. The uh, Hollywood Horror Collection uh, came out in 2006. It had. Um, oh, it had Doctor X on it, and the Return of Doctor X, and Mad Love, and Devil Doll. And uh, what else was on there? But anyway, it also had the Mask of Fu Manchu. I had never seen it before. Yes, the Hollywood Legends of Horror Collection from 2006. Uh, I had never seen uh, Mask of Fu Manchu before. Oh, man, was it exciting. I watched this movie. I got done. The first thing I thought was, Derek is going to love this movie. He's never seen it before. It is... It has got a lot of big, uh, it feels like a, a serial kind of like, you know, all the excitement and action in a serial you'd get in about 90 minutes, about 70 minutes. So really good. I'm not going to say anything more about it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, now, uh, TCM alert for Halloween. Turner Classic Movies. There is a movie from 1953, Argentinian film called El Vampiro Negro. It is an Argentinian remake of Fritz Lang's M. You know, Peter Lurie, that one. Um, I was listening to two separate podcasts. They had nothing to do. One was Joe Dante's. And they both happened to mention it in the same week. So I started to go do a search to see if I could find it online somewhere, and it came up that it was going to come up on Turner Classic Movies. It is October 30th. It will show at midnight, and then they're going to repeat it again at 10 a.m. So that's uh, Saturday night into Sunday morning midnight, and then again at 10 a.m. So, so if you have Turner Classic Movies, uh, it's supposed to be really good from the, uh, or the, the two, uh, two people on two different shows I've mentioned it. Uh, I guess it just was just found or restored this year, and it showed in a, California and a few, uh, you know, repertory. You know, California has all the good, good movie theaters. So, and the real reason I called, and of course, the elephant in the room, I think, needs to be addressed, is Rob Zombie's Monsters on Netflix. I liked it. I thought it was a lot of fun. It's a kids' movie. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not on. I, I'm on Facebook, but I never go on there, so I don't know what the general reaction has been to the uh, Monster uh, Monster Kid Club. Uh, Audience, I don't know how everyone feels about it, but I liked it. I thought, here's the thing, here's how I start the game. Oh my God, is it beautiful. Derek, you ask, what kind of world, what monster movie world would you want to live in? This is the monster movie world I want to live in. Oh my God, the, the sets, the makeup, the, uh, uh, the lighting. Oh, I just, it's like a fluorescent daydream. It's 
gorgeous. I thought all the sets were gorgeous. All the, I mean, I, like I said, I was amazed. This movie was made in Hungary, according to the credits. Um, and I don't know, like, I guess, I don't know what's going on over there, but in the cinematography, I thought this, like I said, I loved it. I loved the way it looked. It was gorgeous. The script, Rob Zombie apparently takes sole credit for the script. It's not the monster movies I would have made. He got heavily into uh, how, I'm going to ruin part of the movie if you haven't seen it yet. He gets into, the whole beginning of the film is how Herman is actually created. I guess the uh, the actual doctor that creates him is mentioned on the show. Again, I'm a fan, not a fanatic. I don't know all the details. Uh, so you get in the whole detail about how Herman was actually created. Uh, and then, you know, there's Lily and um, uh, Al Lewis's character, Grandpa. I can't remember his name. Um, but he, uh, um, I don't know what, um, but anyway, yeah, because he's not called Grandpa yet because there is no Eddie yet. Because this, this is a story of how Herman and Lily meet. Um, but for what it is, I thought it was cute. I thought it was sweet. Is it, other than two, maybe two jokes that were a little PG 13 ish, possibly. This could play on the Disney Channel. This could play on Nickelodeon. This is a fine film. If you've got little kids, I don't think there's anything on there that an eight year old couldn't handle. Um, it's a lot of fun. And, oh, and for, um, for Derek, there is an appearance by Uncle Gil. There is a montage sequence where they're dating, and Uncle Gil shows up for about 30 or 45 seconds. There's a Revenge of the Creature poster, and I think a Creature Walks Among Us poster, and, and there's Uncle Gil in his full uh, his full overcoat, trench coat, and um, scarf and fedora f- uh, uh, outfit. So, again, I liked it. I mean, this is the best script ever? No. I mean, they go to the trouble of showing you how they find Spot. I think that was to threw that out, and you wouldn't have missed anything. I mean, it only doesn't take up that much screen time, but... It's nitpicky. Again, if you're hesitant about watching this, again, I'm a fan of the show, not a fanatic. Given my choice, I would I prefer the Adams Family. But it's fine. I don't think it's no better or worse than any of the other remakes they've done in the last 50 years. So, look, take a chance. If, if you've got Netflix already, throw it on. The worst thing you can do is shut it off. You don't have to watch the whole thing. But try it. I really, I thought it was a lot of fun. So, all right, that's it, group. Thanks, Derek. Thanks for all you do. Talk to you later. Thanks for calling in, Captain Billy. Appreciate it. Uh, so a couple of things. If you do have TCM, do go check out El Vampiro Negro. Uh, it's really good. It's really good. So definitely check that out. As far as the uh, Mask of Fu Manchu films, I don't know if he's listening right now, but when Scott Glancy and I were talking about talking about the, fa- the Mask of Fu Manchu on the show, I made a comment to him that, oh, man, I love all those movies. And he looked at me and said, they only made one. And, uh, yeah, I was actually mixing up the Mr. Wong movies with the Fu Manchu film, which Karloff did like six Mr. Wong films. So, my bad. I do love the Mr. Wong films. Still haven't watched Mask of Fu Manchu, but Scott Glancy uh, is definitely going to be on the show at some point in the near future to talk about that movie. I'm looking forward to getting into that with him. As far as the monsters goes, uh, Herman, at least in the series, was a Frankenstein. He was a Frankenstein creation. I don't know what they did in the film. I haven't watched it yet. I actually got my hands on it before it was officially released through a screener. And uh, I just didn't have time. It's been an incredibly busy month for me uh, with the day job and then working at the haunted house and doing things with Beth and her family. And just I've been super, super busy. So I will eventually get around to watching the monsters. You know, I've watched a few things with Beth. You know, we did like Hocus Pocus 2, which was cute. Not as good as the original, but it was cute. Um, I shared with her one of my favorite found footage films, Hell House LLC, which uh, I really enjoy. But we, we haven't really done a lot of super movie marathons or anything like that. Although there's a chance we may show up for part of the Scarathon this weekend. So, yeah, if you've seen The Monsters, listeners, uh, I'd be curious to hear what you think as well. Do you agree with Captain Billy uh, or or not? Let me know. Drop me an email or let's see. Let me pull up the voicemail line. This is a very loose episode of Monster Kid Radio, folks. Uh, let's see. The voicemail line is 360-524-2484. I know I normally have The Monsters in the Machine read that to you, but uh, they're on the computer that's been spending a weekend at Tom's. So voicemail again, 360-524-2484, or email me at monsterkidradio at gmail.com. Live from the land of light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty ultra heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. The alien guts planning to invade Earth believed defeating Seven would be a shortcut. 
They used the monster Aron to test his abilities and came to Earth with a plan to assassinate Ultra Seven. It proved to be an uphill battle, and Seven's energy reached depletion. In the end, Seven, who acted in service of peace on Earth, fell into the hands of the alien guts. At the time, the Terrestrial Defense Force were searching for Dan and Soga under Captain Kiriyama's leadership. However, the Ultra Guard were only able to find and rescue Soga. The alien guts announced they would execute Seven at dawn. A report from the astronomy team told them dawn would come at 5.29 a.m. If they didn't somehow rescue Seven by then, Earth would fall in a situation where they surrender to the alien guts. This is the recap found at the beginning of this week's episode of Ultra 7, Episode 40, The Ultra 7 Assassination Plot, Part 2. At the very end of last week's episode, it was reported that an unidentified tone was being broadcast using TDF space station circuits. That tone turned out to be generated by Ultra 7 himself, the substance of the message being a description of the energy that he needed in order to revive. The Ultra Guard applies themselves to harnessing the energy, which is the equivalent of four hydrogen bombs. In order to focus that level of energy, a highly specialized ore must be utilized. However, it is an ore found only in Africa. Incredibly, Furuhashi was gifted this very substance by a friend who kept half for herself. Now, the race is on to obtain her part before alien guts can interfere. Will the TDF be able to manufacture this immense energy in time and resurrect Ultra 7? Part 2, while unable to sustain the frenetic pace of Part 1 of the Seven assassination plan, does something remarkable. It puts the Terrestrial Defense Force and Ultra Guard in the position of being the ones who save the day. If the Ultra Guard does not transmit the energy to Seven, it's game over, giving them great agency in the story and a true reason for being. The final scene is particularly effective. As Dan horses around with the other Guard members, the narrator implies that other alien forces are likely taking notes on the failed Guts invasion in order to launch attacks of their own. A bit of ominous foreshadowing, setting up the final nine episodes of this epic series. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Matsky reporting. death personalized by the motion picture screens prints of horror vincent price so then shouldn't you be on your knees to give thanks no i beg of you mercy mercy lavishly he plants his corrupting seeds of sin spreading living terror that not even the unsullied can escape ah! each man creates his own heaven his own hell let me see your face. Hello there, Monster Kid Radio Heads. This is Kenny with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. Halloween is just a few days away, so today we're going to see how classic famous monsters made 1960s Halloween better. For its entire run, FM was a one-stop year-round Halloween shop where you can buy items for your costume or your house decoration. We are going to read from FM 9, which came out in the fall of 1960. It starts with this Halloween-themed editorial from Uncle Forey. If the letter carrier brought you this issue in his pouch, in which case you must be an Australian and your mailman must be a kangaroo, then it should be just about one month till Halloween. Or, if you grab this issue the first day it goes on sale at your favorite newsstand or supermarket, you too should have one month ahead of you till Halloween night. 
But what we were about to point out before we were so rudely interrupted by a shaggy dinosaur was, unless you have been tardy in securing this, the first of our bi-monthly issues, you now have four weeks in which to cut yourself down a small tree in order to whittle out a boomstick. A boomstick looks like a gun and you play trick-or-treat with it. Get yourself a kin to fasten onto your pump so you'll be sure to have a pump kin. Cut out a cover from a back issue of Favorite Monsters and make a mask of it. Hollow out a suitable ween so that when the time comes you'll have a hollow ween. On the other hand, you don't have to wait a month till Halloween. It's here now, in your hands. Famous Monsters is the only magazine in the world that brings you Halloween every 60 days, six times a year. Now let's hear about some of the items in the back pages that could be used to make your Halloween better. Starting on page 37, we have an aisle full of cool stuff for our trick or treating. Let's start with the masks. Lagoon Monster. Horrifying greenish over-the-head mask covers entire face. Needs no elastic to keep on. Terrific shocker with yellowish and red features. Looks just like real Hollywood kind. With lumpy skin and scales like fish. Very scary. Only $2. Mohawk Indian. Amazingly realistic. Mask has scalp lock with real hair and braid and back. Just like true Indian. Face is strikingly painted with war paint on nose, cheeks, forehead, chin... Top of mask gives genuine bald effect. Savage Cannibal. Frightening replica of native Amazon chieftain. Looks like the savage tribesmen from out of the King Kong story. Weird red animal horns on each side of head. Bushy hair and fierce expression make this a truly fantastic mask. Jekyll and Hyde. Something really new. A two-in-one mask that looks like both Jekyll and Hyde at the same time. Nothing like it anywhere. Change faces just by turning your head slightly. Shock Monster. Here's a mask that will shock people out of a year's growth. Eerie green skin, black twisted hair, yellow teeth, and a staring eye make this one of the most horrible characters ever created in rubber. Girl Vampire. A white skinned monstrosity with long black hair and big red lips. Perfect for girl ghouls to wear when scaring family and friends. Even Mom will have fun wearing this to scare bill collectors away. Teenage Werewolf. A new mask just created in answer to the many requests we've had for a replica of the werewolf character now so popular with the teenagers. Colorful, hairy typeface with mouth open showing seven razor-sharp teeth. One-Eyed Cyclops. A big blue-green eye in the middle of the forehead. Nothing like it anywhere. Walk down the street with this mask on and watch the people run. Invisible slits allow you to see out of both your eyes. Gorilla Monster. Imitation black hair and a mouth full of gorilla teeth make this ape mask a real horror creation. Be the King Kong of your neighborhood. Super Frankenstein Mask. This horrifying heavy rubber mask was worn by our Frankenstein on the cover of Famous Monsters Number 1. It's the super deluxe version of our Frankenstein face mask and covers the entire head. Impossible to tell who you are when you wear this eerie green Hollywood shocker. Has red lips, scars, and silver bolts on neck and forehead. Black hair. Only $3.98. Zachary. This amazing realistic mask of the original TV ghoul must be seen to be believed. A work of art painstakingly painted with careful attention to detail. This mask is designed to fit over the top of the head and requires no elastic to keep on. The Zachary Super Mask gives the appearance of being completely lifelike and fits all faces. Easily the most comfortable rubber mask ever made. Fits loosely on face and can be worn over eyeglasses. Hours of fun with the Zachary Super Mask. Here are some accessories and decorative items. Lagoon Monster Hands. Frightening green rubber hands with red webbing go perfectly with the Lagoon Monster mask. Hands fit like glove. Move with fingers. Only one fifty each hand or $3 for a complete pair. Two Thumb Hand. Never in history has there been a hand like this. Colorful, flesh-colored, human-type hand, but with two thumbs. 
exposed bone and Frankenstein type stitch wrist. Octopus hand. Here is the perfect shocker for parties, etc. Wear one of these realistic looking octopus tentacles. Fits like a glove. They'll scream when you pull it out of your pocket. Green with red, yellow, and white suckers. Dracula teeth. These sensational fang plastic teeth will actually glow in the dark. Made to fit between the lip and the gums of both children and adults. Really looks horrible, like Dracula himself. Monster foot. Gruesome feet are giant size to go over shoes. Made of latex rubber and horribly painted. These ghoulish feet will frighten all. Create a riot wherever you wear them. Vampire nails. Girls, here's your chance to look like a genuine vampire with a set of sleeky looking black vampire nails that can be worn on the fingers or even on the toes. Boys, here's the perfect gift for your ghoul friend. Shrunken head. Looks so real it will amaze everyone. Replica of the Amazon head with black 10 inch long hair can be hung on a wall, suspended from a ceiling, or placed on shelf. Comes complete with ring and nose. Last but not least, a perfect for your door life-size poster of a monster kid hero. You can have Zachary in your own home. Think of it. He's six feet tall, life-size, unbelievably realistic giant photo pinup, looks absolutely alive. Really out of this world, here he is at last. Zachary himself, all six feet of your favorite ghoul, now available in a full-size pinup that you'll keep forever. This is the most striking six-foot-tall photo you ever saw, a masterpiece of reproduction that will startle anyone who sees it. You'll think Zachary is actually in the same room with you. The Zachary pinup will supply a hundred hours of laughs. Think of the gags you can pull and the fun you can have with six-foot Zach. Have your photograph taken alongside your favorite ghoul. Scotch tape the Zach pin up to the inside of your den or bedroom door. Put it between someone's bed sheets. Ring doorbell. When friend answers, hide behind the full-size figure of Zach. A million dollars worth of ghoulish glee with Zachary. That is all for this week's spooky look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. We will have more next week. For MKR, this is Kenny saying adios. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing wrong with the projection. But you can't share the shock until you have the miracle movie mask. At showings of this motion picture, each patron will receive his own miracle movie mask. Then, but let's watch the scene again. Then you will lift your mask as he lifts his, and you will look through it with him into the weirdest nightmare world that man has ever dreamed or the screen has ever dared show. The new realm of horror that can only be seen through the mask. Here to tell you more is the supreme authority on all things weird. Initiate of the strange and mysterious. The world's greatest connoisseur and collector of masks, Mr. Jim Moran. I have seen wonders. I've traveled to the remotest corners of the globe, to dead cities, through savage jungles, to the inner sanctums of esoteric cults, the temples of exotic rituals, to tombs and caverns and palaces. The result, the most comprehensive collection of masks in the world. Some are works of art, some are astounding and horrifying, but nowhere in all my travels have I found a mask so absolutely remarkable as this mask the miracle movie fright mask the mask that you will be invited to put on when you see the motion picture called the mask this is the mask that will open your eyes to such things as man has never dared imagine the mask that will make you part of the sensations of the most staggering experience of your life but be warned the things that you will see when you put on this mask will surely take you to the very limits of your nerves and to the very boundary line of sanity.
Hello there, Derek. This is Mark Matsky, your very own Beta Capsule Review correspondent, Monster and Kaiju Kid. I just wanted to provide you and your listeners with a brief rundown of my Monster Bash experience uh, for this past weekend. My son Andy and I had the good fortune of attending uh, the latest October Bash that started actually the evening of October 13th. And uh, just do that as for my own fun in remembering uh, the experience, but also if you weren't able to make it, you can live vicariously uh, through our experience. That really truly is a way that Monster Kid Radio functioned, especially in 2020 and 21. For me, not able to get to conventions and conventions weren't even happening at the time. So going back through the the catalog of episodes of M- MKR uh, became something that was a real touchstone for me and partially what motivated me to reach out to you and get involved with the podcast through uh, beta capsule reviews and so forth. But all of that said, I just wanted to give... Uh, all those Monster Bash fans out there, a sense of what this bash was like and what what we got out of it, uh, which was quite a bit. Um, the As I mentioned, it started on October 13th, and that's something that I happily discovered really accidentally at our first bash was the fact that on the Thursday night before things get cranked up Friday morning, the projectionist Jeffrey Curtis just plays random movies and TV episodes, trailers, etc. And the first time that happened, I just wandered into it. This was, I think, around 2014 at our first bash. But now we plan for it because I just so much enjoy the random element of going around, you know, looking at the creepy classics booth, which is set up and open on Thursday nights, and then just wandering into something great. And it it is always proven true um, throughout all the years that we've gone at this point that on Thursday night, we end up watching something that we've never seen before and is extremely good. And it's just so exciting. That's one of my favorite things about Bash. Uh, to be candid, is that I'm exposed to things that I didn't know about, see films that I had maybe only heard of or seen in a book, have it referenced, you know, in some sort of review fashion. But Monster Bash creates the opportunities to see things, uh, see new things, or at least things that are new to me, which is kind of, is a novel concept today, you know, when everything seems to be at our fingertips. The fact that you can still go to a movie convention and see stuff that you didn't know even existed, I think is a pretty special thing. So all of that is to say, we arrived at on Thursday afternoon at the Marriott Pittsburgh North in Cranberry Township. Uh, this is a, a different venue than the one that we'd been at in the past. Uh, in June, the, the bash was also at the Marriott and I have to say, it's a it's a good move. I think it's a nice facility. The rooms are really quite nice, and the convention area is roughly equivalent of what it was before um, over at the Double Tree. A lot a lot of great room for creepy classics and what they've got set up, and they're sort of the most uh, reliable browsing station. Uh, between events and so forth. So it it was really good. Also, the way that the uh, event and movie ballroom was oriented is kind of um, different than it was at the Doubletree, which is to say that where in the past the, the movie room was kind of long and narrow. If you imagine a similar space, but put the screen and the stage on the side in front of, instead of at the end, And that's kind of what you have now, which works out to make everybody a little bit closer to the screen and to the front, which I thought was pretty satisfying, especially for watching the films and listening to the guests, because you're 
you don't have to scramble to get a closer seat. Uh, that's kind of a, a nice, nice element. So Thursday night, the first full-length film that we saw, and this is what fills the criteria for me of a, a new watch, was the film Topper Returns, uh, starring Joan Blondell. And this is a, a movie that I had never seen. I had, I had heard of the movie Topper, but I'd never seen it. That one stars Cary Grant, of course. So it's sort of like coming into a series at least two-thirds of the way through, maybe longer. But this is a real charming sort of haunted house movie. It starts out pretty much straight-ahead slapstick almost, or, or screwball comedy, I should say. And then very quickly takes a turn into the haunted house genre and then goes in directions I guess I wasn't expecting but are really entertaining. And so that was right out of the gate sort of the thing that I love most about Bash is seeing something I'd never seen before and truly enjoying it, really being absorbed in that story and and really delighted by it. So now, of course, I'm Super interested in exploring the rest of the Topper series. You know, Cosmo Topper is at the heart of this, just sort of a droll, dry, uh, everything happens to me sort of character and just made for a great viewing experience. And then after Topper Returns came uh, Tarantula. And that was awesome. That was shown on 16 millimeter. Uh, so was Topper Returns for that matter. And again, there's just something very special to me about hearing that projector going and hearing the reels sort of flapping when they end. And no, the picture quality is not the greatest. Uh, the sound is surprisingly good with that. But uh, seeing Tarantula 16 millimeter print was extremely entertaining and engaging. And, you know, there's tons that could be said, has been said about the movie Tarantula. But the one thing that, well, two things, I guess. Two things I'll mention is how great the cast is in that movie. And secondly, the effects are really quite good. I, I really love how they did that. And it's it's very simply executed. But all the shots where the Tarantula sort of appears or is on the move are convincing. It's easy to... to Imagine, put yourself in the situation where there's a giant spider on the loose and it's just, it's, it's a great, great movie to see in that, that setting. So that was it. We called it after Tarantula, went up to our room, got ready for Friday morning. And Friday starts with the traditional screening of Monsters We've, We've Known and Loved, a documentary produced in 1964 narrated by Joseph Cotton. At this point, I think we've seen and we've seen it enough because Monster Bash always begins with the screening of that special. Uh, that can almost start reciting the narration word for word. But I don't know. I'm a creature of habit. I love um, tradition and routine. So I, I really appreciate having the conference start that way every time. It just gives you a sense of, okay, now we're really here and everything's going. It's the entry. It's the gateway into Bash, truly. That was followed by uh, Bill Diamond talking about his production facility on the banks of the Hudson River. Um, a little interesting news about Witch's Dungeon, which is uh, Cortland Hall's museum. Uh, it sounds as if that's going to ultimately uh, move from Connecticut to this production facility in New York. And of course, that's all the, the timing remains to be seen. But that was cool, a really cool sort of behind the scenes look at Bill Diamond Enterprises and uh, the, the place where all of the things that he does are produced. It really is. It's a retrofitted factory and serves as a production house now with the back lot and everything. Uh, really, really interesting and a, a steady presence at Monster Bash for many years running. Next, we saw the film My Favorite Brunette with Bob Hope and Dorothy L'Amour. For monster fans, you know, the real attraction of that movie is the fact that Lon Chaney 
Jr. appears and is sort of doing a send-up of his Lenny role, but is in service of a sanitarium. Also, Peter Lorre is an assassin who's working for the bad guys. And of course, Bob Hope's at the center of it all uh, with his real zingy dialogue, snappy writing. Um, full disclosure, I, I would have to watch that film again with subtitles on to catch everything about the plot and all the double crossing and stuff that goes on. Uh, but it didn't really affect the enjoyment of that film, especially when uh, Lon Chaney Jr. was on the screen. And his interactions with Bob Hope in that film are, are pretty priceless. Uh, after that, we broke for lunch and came back in time to see the Bowery Boys Meet the Monsters. And uh, this was this was pretty wild. And I have to say, as shocking as it is even to myself, this was basically my first exposure to the Bowery Boys. And, um, you know, I had seen in passing some of like Spooks Run Wild and those movies, but um, especially, and, and Andy, my son, especially, this was a, a first for him as well. And it was, uh, we had a, we had a blast with it. Uh, I don't know what we were expecting, but it was just, uh, I think zany is the word that I keep coming back to. Um, the, the Bowery boys end up interacting with sort of mad scientists, gorilla robots, a vampire like woman, the weirdest scenes have to do with a man-eating plant. It was, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's like all of uh, the, the best points of Bash for me. Now I'm like on a, on a kick to find out more about the Bowery Boys, and I'm astounded to sort of learn the various iterations that they went through, the, the sheer number of movies that were produced under sort of the East Side Kids Bowery Boys banner. Uh, amazing stuff, really. The next thing that we um, were sure to be present for, because at, by this time the dealer's room had opened, so we were heeding the the siren call of the dealers. Uh, we were made sure to be back in good position for Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, and that was the main movie of the evening just blown away by how well that movie stands up over time. And in particular, what struck me this time through was how Lou Costello truly owns every scene that he's in. Just a phenomenal talent. And I guess perhaps in my mind, in contrast uh, to other comedy teams, Abbott and Costello are just head and shoulders above in my book. And this film really represents them firing on all cylinders. I also really was, it struck me how uh, smoothly there are vaudeville style routines mixed into this film. Uh, they're not completely obvious in their placement, but they're, the, they're in there. And just a, just a wonderful, wonderful film. One of my favorite movies of all time, if we're going to, get into that but so great and i guess here's the thing to watch that with a monster bash crowd is just a, a wonderful experience because people were into it and if memory serves i there may have been people in the crowd who this was their first viewing of abbott and costello meet frankenstein so they were truly entertained and uh, delighted by the comedy in the film which made for a rewarding viewing experience On the heels of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein was the interview with Ron Chaney, which was awesome. Uh, Ron is really just a, a real friend of the fans. And one of the things that was exceptional about his presentation was the fact that we were able to view a trailer of a musical that's being produced with his blessing, uh, a, a a Broadway-style musical about the life of Lon Chaney Sr. And evidently that had a short run in Michigan 
before COVID shut it down. But they are shopping that to other theaters in the United States, and hopefully, fingers crossed, that's going to run in other places. And it really looks fantastic. So that's one of the irons that Ron Chaney has in the fire right now, as well as continuing to mention a book that he's working on that actually goes back a couple generations, evidently. But he just wants to get it right, but also, I think, feels the responsibility of being the one to get it out to the public. So we'll see what the timing is like on that. But it's so enticing to think of a Cheney-produced book about that incredible family. One of the great things about Friday night is Mexican Monster Night, and the movie this year was Castle, The Castle of Monsters from 1958. Uh, this was not shown dubbed, nor were there uh, subtitles to let you in on anything that was happening from a dialogue standpoint, which is kind of a shame because really the first one-third, almost two-thirds of the film were dialogue-heavy sort of comedy sketches. Uh, this was billed in the program as sort of the south of the border version of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Um so you could follow what was happening. It wasn't beyond anyone watching. But some of the specific comedy, I think, was lost on the English-speaking audience, which was too bad. But the real attraction was the appearance of monsters in the last third of the film. And although it was a, a werewolf and a vampire and a mummy and a Frankenstein monster... And kind of a creature from the Black Lagoon. It was sort of close, but no cigar. And the result was um, it was entertaining. Let's put it that way. You know what you're getting into at Mexican Monster Night. And the the final third of it was just so outlandish and funny and just fun. And of course, uh, before Mexican Monster Night movies start screening, the... Um, Bash committee comes in with Taco Bell um, burritos and and tacos, uh, just passing them out. So that really gets you in the mood uh, for what's coming. So that was it for me following um, Mexican Monster Night. I called it a day at that point, and it was already Saturday by then. So uh, what we what we did then Saturday was. I watched the first part of The Cat and the Canary. Um, Andy and I ducked into the dealer's room after a while, and then we were back in place for the Brain Twist quiz show with Tom Weaver, which was, again, just a blast. Uh, Tom, of course, if you're listening to this podcast, then chances are you know Tom Weaver is just a prolific writer on the subject of old school horror and sci-fi and has probably published more than any one person on that subject, uh, he hosts a quiz show and he just has like mounds of papers that he's prepared specifically for the quiz show and sort of degrees of difficulty questions d depending on who he gets to volunteer to be part of the quiz show. And it was really cool. It's great to sit there and sort of test your own knowledge of things and uh, see how much he knows, and Tom just has a great sense of humor that suits itself to this um, context. So it was that was great fun. Uh, after lunch, I watched uh, a horror comedy that was kind of the loose theme of the films uh, from the beginning of the planning stages of this particular bash with sort of horror comedy hybrids. There's a movie from 1935. Um, a mascot master feature, so a Poverty Row level production, but a really great cast. The movie is called One Frightened Night. And this was, again, an old dark house sort of haunted house film having to do with the reading of a will and families sort of jostling for their piece of the pie, so to speak. But is... Um, as I mentioned, the cast really sells this very well. Uh, from the opening scene of this crotchety old man 
uh, sort of telling each person what they're going to get from him in his will until a member of the family shows up. After that uh, was another game show uh, called What's My Monster, hosted by Leonard Hayhurst and Tom Shabilla. This has become sort of a, a tradition now at Monster Bash, uh, the What's My Monster taking off on the old What's My Line television show, a quiz show, and the whole the whole crowd gets involved. It's really a lot of a lot of fun, and uh, trying to stump the panel of the monster that's being thought about. There were a couple cases where the panel sort of had a, a walk off home run equivalent of answering, you, you thought for sure they were stumped and they just pulled it out of nowhere. So really cool feature. These interactive sort of simple game shows have gotten quite a following at Bash. It's, it's just super fun to be in the audience for those. Following uh, the quiz show, we watched Masterminds from 1949, another Bowery Boys movie. And this one is, um, I think, made especially of interest for monster kids because of the presence of Glenn Strange playing a sort of non-specifically ape-like or wolf-like humanoid uh, called Atlas the Monster. Um, early, so fairly early in the movie, Atlas the Monster, played by, by Glenn Strange, switches brains with Hunts Hall, who's a Satch in the Bowery Boys. And there's a lot of unanswered questions that I have, <laughs> but I don't think you're supposed to overthink a Bowery Boys movie. But anyway, it was a lot of fun. We, we had a sense of what we were getting into now, and we're not disappointed in that regard. Later on that day, we made it into the question and answer um, interview of a couple of the stars of Land of the Lost, Wesley Ure and Kathy Coleman. That was interesting. That show was on Saturday mornings when I was a little kid. And full disclosure, I was not a huge fan of Land of the Lost because, you know, I really, what I wanted was giant monsters. And there just weren't enough giant monsters in Land of the Lost for my taste. But I can't appreciate the nostalgia factor of that era. And so it was really cool to listen to uh, Wes and Kathy talk because they really were reunited through the convention circuit and realized that there is a, a market out there and there are fans out there of Land of the Lost who are really excited to meet with them and talk to them. And it was eye-opening to see the other productions that both of them had been involved in. I believe Wesley uh, was kind of a co-creator of a show called Dragon Tales, which was an animated show for kids uh, back when my son was real little. So that was kind of a, a, a thing to discover that I had no idea about. Following that Q&A, there was actually a wedding at Bash. Uh, vendor Terry Mount wedded Tom Alsup and uh, Monster Bash staffer Mark Statler, is also an ordained minister, did the wedding. And as I told my son while we were there, this is one of those things that's absolutely unique that will never, ever happen ever again, at least in my reckoning, where you'll have the same sort of unique <laughs> scenario playing out. Uh, what I mean by that is, just as an example, to have the bride given away by someone dressed as Count Dracula. You just won't see that again, I don't imagine. That led right into the traditional eating of the cake on uh, Saturday night, which in this case was a wedding cake. Uh, couldn't have been more appropriate. That was followed by uh, the question and answer session with uh, Zandor Vorkov, who played Dracula from Dracula and Bra uh, Dracula versus Frankenstein. 
extremely interesting interview. Um, Xander Vorkov for many, many years was incognito. Nobody really knew what he was up to, what he was doing, or if he was still alive at all. And the interview that he gave was really excellent and eye-opening. I, I think I keep using that phrase, but it really was in his case. It, it really was clear to me in the type of answers that he was giving that he had a great deal of ambivalence about starring as Count Dracula, especially because the horror genre sort of celebrates things that I don't know that Vorkov is really into celebrating, which is to say, you know, movie violence and stylized scares. Uh, it doesn't sound to me that that's something he's all that um, excited to be associated with, although he is embracing the uh, notoriety that he has about this role. His movie career was extremely limited. If I'm not mistaken, he had exactly two roles in film, Dracula and Frankenstein being one, uh, the other one being Brain of Blood. But when uh, a, document, a documentary uh, director for Severin Films got in touch with him uh, to do a documentary about the film, Doc, uh, Dracula versus Frankenstein, it led to a, a realization that he had, Vorkov had fans of him in this film and that they would be interested in what he had to say. I think the fascinating thing is what he has to say may not be what they're expecting. So his presence at Bash was was pretty cool and a, a different twist on sort of the uh, just the the straight up celebration of these films that you might expect. His some of his answers and the things that he said during his interview were probably a bit of a challenge to some of the people uh, who were present, but I thought it was just quite quite interesting. That was followed by a selection of. Uh, musical Numbers by Mark Statler. Yes, the same Mark Statler who was uh, the the officiant of the wedding. Uh, he and his brother have written a number of Monster Bash themed songs. Some of them were recorded with the Hammer Girls. And one was even uh, sort of a, you know, like the song Unforgettable with uh, Natalie Cole and the recording of her father was a huge hit not too long ago. Well, maybe longer ago than I care to admit, but uh, Mark Statler has a song that's like that, except the the voice on the other end is Victoria Carlson, which is kind of a sobering thing now that she's gone, but uh, he sings a duet with her uh, through the magic of technology, and there was a sort of a, a clip show of highlights from her career that was playing as he was singing. It was uh, kind of a surreal experience. Uh, if I'm being candid, but it was uh, well done and cool to hear Mark Statler sort of contribute to Bash in that way. There were three of the uh, Three Stooges shorts that were specifically sort of haunted house monster themed that were introduced by uh, TV's Son of Ghoul. Then it was time for the Festival of the New Wine Song which leads into the prize toss. And that is, again, high tradition at this point, just part of the Monster Bash fabric. And I was very pleased to catch a plastic skull as part of the, the prize toss. And my son, Andy, caught a DVD and a little plastic dinosaur. So that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, there have been times where we've been shut out of the prize toss because we were too far back in the room. So there were no bad seats for the prize toss this year. There's not too much more that I have to say about Sunday because we left relatively early. So I'm going to leave that pretty much alone. I did see a few uh, little rascal shorts in the morning. That's a bit of a tradition as well. But then there were some things in the dealer's room that I really wanted to pick up before we left. And the ones that I want to talk about, are, I'll just do real quickly. One was a book written by, well, they're both books. One was a book written by 
uh, John Kitley, who runs the website, um, it's, let's see, the website is Kitley's Crypt, and Crypt is with a K, uh, K-I-T-L-E-Y-S, K-R-Y-P-T dot com, Kitley's Crypt. And uh, John also sells books. He's a vendor at Bash, and he wrote his own book. It's called Discover the Horror, One Man's 50-Year Quest for Monsters, Maniacs, and the Meaning of It All. And so after talking to John for a while in the dealer's room, I decided to pick up a copy of his book, and I'm looking forward to reading it. It's one that I think any monster kid will instantly relate to and really resonate with. So uh, look look up John. Again, it's kitleyscrypt.com, uh, kitley and crypt with Ks. And the other book I picked up from him that I was very excited about was a hardcover edition of Tom Weaver's Poverty Row Horrors, monogram PRC and Republic Horror Films of the 40s. I picked up a paperback version of that at one of my first bashes, maybe my second bash, and just love that book so much. It's It's been an entryway into a lot of enjoyable films and just trying to locate some of these films in the first place to watch them. Uh, but to get a, a hardcover edition of that uh, was really exciting for me. So I was happy to walk away with a couple great books from Bash. I got a few others as well. And some other um, accoutrements. Uh, the Super 7, Glow in the Dark, Godzilla, and Mechagodzilla. Of course, I was not going to walk away without any kaiju at all. So all in all, it was an extremely enjoyable Bash. The October Bashes are super laid back and always plenty of elbow room to do everything. If you want to go for like the, the excitement and the synergy and the dynamic feeling, uh, you, I think you would probably want to look at the June Bash. But if you're looking for something real laid back and uh, easy going and easy access to everything, uh, check out the October Bashes because they are just a sort of, uh, just a, has an easy feel to it that I really appreciate and enjoy. I, I truly hope those keep going. I, I don't know that they are or at, that they're not, but what I will say is that information has already been released regarding the June Bash next year, and one of the, the featured guests is going to be a granddaughter of Bela Lugosi, and also a kind of a friend of ours, Pamela Pierce, whose father uh, directed and shot uh, The Legend of Boggy Creek. So uh, June's looking great for Bash. I don't think I'm going to be able to go to Bash in June, so I'm really got fingers crossed for another October show next year. All right, well, that went on a little bit longer than I expected, Derek. I, I, uh, I thank you for your patience, but I just wanted to share that with you. It was, uh, again, uh, me and, and my son, it was a real great father and son experience for us. That's what bash truly means to me is having those special times uh, with my son and with my dad when he's been able to join us for that. And uh, like I said before, getting to see stuff and be exposed, new little avenues to take in this uh, fandom of ours. So thanks for giving me the forum to share my experiences. I hope that other people enjoyed that as well. Maybe gave them a sense of what Bash is like if they've never been to one. I highly recommend it. Uh, Ron Adams and his staff are absolutely great and just uh, as interactive as you would hope them to be and uh, just lead to an enjoyable event. It's uh, I've heard Ron talk on different podcasts and, and Monster Kid Radio included and kind of refers to Monster Bash as a family reunion and sort of a monster kid picnic get-together, and it really has that sort of comfortable, fun feel to it. So if that appeals to you at all, I hope you'll get to a bash in the Pittsburgh area sometime in the near future. Thanks for listening to this, and uh, enjoy the rest of the episode. <laughs>
<laughs> I love you so much. I love you so much. Somebody honking at me? They're just like saying hi. Oh, okay. Because. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't pulling somebody or something. I gotta say, I, I honestly thought that uh, when I came out the back of the haunt the first time tonight, and and Carlos scared me. He was hiding to wait to scare a patron, and he scared me, and I was like, whoa, because I don't get scared very often by them. I thought that was going to be the big surprise of the night. <laughs> oh. Well, we'll use that as our intro to, to our conversation here. How about that? Okay. All right. So, um, you know, we are doing a check-in. <laughs> it is uh, basically the end of a haunt. We are on our final stretch at Scare Rounds PDX. By the time you hear this, listeners, you'll still have time. It's still running through Halloween, and I still highly recommend it. I'm working in the ticket booth, and I'm having a better time than I thought I would. I, I didn't have the highest of hopes because it was working during my favorite month, but I was able to pull off something <laughs> during my favorite month because of my association with Scaregrounds PDX, and uh, I, I consider myself part of the Scaregrounds PDX family at this point. Absolutely. So I am driving Beth home right now. We just got off work. It's uh, Wednesday night as of this recording. <laughs> How has the season gone so far? Oh my god, I mean, it's this honestly has so far been the season of my dreams. Getting control over uh, designing, you know, the haunt the way I wanted to and, and, and the faith and, the, and you know, and, and really the faith that the organizers put in me to put a haunt together the way I wanted and to trust that some of the new things I wanted to try were really going to work and they have, they've worked tremendously and our cast is amazing. We have, every night we have more and more volunteers coming in because people come as guests and then go, hey, I want to come back and volunteer. This is so much fun. I, the, the season has just been phenomenal. We've had several nights with sold out crowds. Um, tonight was a little lighter being a Wednesday. Tomorrow night, Thursday, will be a great night to come down and be a little lighter. And we run all the way through Monday on Halloween. And, and I, I got to admit, yeah, I really thought tonight coming out the back of my haunt at the start of the night that one of my actors scaring me, which is a very rare occasion, was going to be the biggest surprise of the night. But, uh... But whatever are you talking about, Beth? out. So, get about a third of the way through the night and, uh... I get this call, and it's one of the big bosses on the radio, and you guys got to understand, this person never gets on the radio. Like, the last time I heard so this person get on the radio, someone had busted an ankle, okay? <laughs> so, years ago. So he gets on the radio, and I think, oh, God, it's some big emergency, and they're calling for me in one of my rooms, and I go rushing over there, and someone has moved the fog machine out of place, so I realize, oh, the room's not foggy. That must be the problem. So I quickly move the fog machine back into place and start fogging up the room, and I start walking away, and I get another call on the radio. No, 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 you gotta come back in the room. The problem's in the room. And then someone else nearby goes, I think someone fell. So I take off at a run with my cane, which is pretty hilarious, let me tell you, dressed head to toe like the Wicked Witch of the West. And for the first time ever, it uh, looks like Alphaba got, uh, got her dream. And, and Derek's right, haunted houses really are where dreams come true because waiting for me in that room were multiple members of my Scaregrounds family and the most important person in the world to me, Derek, with a beautiful ring. And he got down on one knee and told me how much he loved me and proposed. And of course, you guys, I said yes, of course I did. And now I'm going to be his wife. <laughs> if I wasn't driving right now, I'd be giving her a full-on hug. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I didn't realize Beth was going to lead with that. <laughs> I probably should have. He did so good, guys. <laughs> I really did want to talk about the haunt, how things are going, but um, this is, uh, no, she's right. I, I've i been planning this for a little while, and um, 
Scaregrounds helped me make it special. So, you know, no matter what happens, no matter, no matter where we go in our lives, <laughs> I think Beth and I will always, I'm not saying that we're not going back. We're going to keep working for Scaregrounds as long as we can. But no matter what happens in our lives, we will always consider Scaregrounds our family and Absolutely. very, very important. Because they, they helped me make this moment special. Um, I don't know if you rec recognize this or register this, Beth, but in my house, in my apartment, I have a whiteboard on the, on the left wall mm -hmm. when you first walk in. Yeah. My intention was, uh, when I started doing a bunch of YouTube videos, which I never did, that whiteboard was going to be in the background. I was going to kind of use that for, you know, doing YouTube videos and stuff. Mm -hmm. In the upper left-hand corner of that whiteboard is a little doodle that says Deadline October. Has that ever registered with you? Have you ever wondered about that? Well, I figured it was like with your book you're working on or something. Or... Well, you know, here's the thing. October being the most magical time of the year for people like us. Yes. It's a special time, you know. Halloween, October, fall, all that stuff is, is kind of where we live. And originally, when I first moved into that apartment, I had these grand plans. YouTube, videos, podcasting, writing, all of it. I was going to be able to say that I'm no longer working for the man in October. Um, that October was going to be the month that I break away and I am an independent con uh, content creator doing my thing. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, I got to about uh, July or so and realized it's not happening. A little bit of depression there, but yeah. not much because I had you in my life at that point. Absolutely. Then I started thinking, October is still special. <laughs> what if? Because I'm pretty sure she's my forever person. Mm -hmm. What if I make that the month that I propose to Beth? <laughs> and so I've been working on that for months now. And, uh, I'm so yeah. surprised. <laughs> I was genuinely so surprised. It's oh, uh, you guys will have to go and look at the photos. The ring is just beautiful and it fits perfectly, and it's it's, it's everything I I could have wanted. <laughs> it's, I'm so happy. I've been trying to. I've been all sneaky, sneaky for months now. <laughs> what kind of gems do you like? <laughs> <laughs> what room is your favorite room in the haunt? <laughs> So um, I, I'm glad that we're sharing this with the, the podcast because I think, folks, you're going to hear Beth in a lot of my stuff moving forward. Yeah. Uh, we've also got some plans to do some things apart from Monster Kid Radio in the future. Mm -hmm. Seriously, though, I did want to talk about the haunt. <laughs> oh, gosh, you guys. I mean, seriously. this it, it, Now, I, I will say maybe since the last time we've talked about the haunt... Uh, a really neat thing has happened. Uh, PDX Scaregrounds has been named the scariest haunted houses in the state of Oregon, which if you're outside Oregon, uh, there's a great list on our website that you can go and check out what the scariest haunted house nearest you is. But if you do happen to be in the Washington, Oregon, Idaho area and you can come on down to Scaregrounds, we're, we're super proud of that because we've been for a long time uh, the most family friendly haunt in the area. And we always have at least one haunt that is family friendly and okay for even the littlest of kids. But to be the scariest thing is really the highest honor you can achieve in haunting, and we're pretty dang proud of that. Um, we have something like two dozen full-size animatronics. Some of them get as tall as 16 feet when fully extended, guys. If that's not enough to make you pee your pants, I don't know what is. And that was uh, MSN that did that survey, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I will try to find the link to that, and I'll put a link in the show notes over at monsterkidradio.net. Um. And, you know, it's just been this great culmination of multiple years. And I, I know for a lot of businesses, the pandemic was a really hard time. And for things like scare houses, where you have to be in people's faces, that was really scary for a lot of companies. And a lot of them went out of business. And we stayed strong as a family and got creative and worked out solutions and stayed patient and, you know, just really put our noses to the grindstone and coming out the other side what we have is just this phenomenal foundation for the business to grow and grow and extend and go into other areas and it, it really it really is an amazing all immersive experience 
we definitely encourage you if you're coming down, dress up. We love costumes. We have all kinds of walk around characters that you'll recognize. Everything from Freddy to Jason to Pennywise to ah, uh, random I, scary clowns. I haven't seen Jason yet. Oh, I've seen Jason. Okay. He, he, he was real busy tonight. There were a lot of cute girls to chase in his defense. Fair enough. Yeah, it, it, was, it was teenage girl night tonight, so a lot, <laughs> a lot of cute girls to murder. You know how it is. Um, so when you say it's all immersive, I want to throw in there, Oaks Park, which is the amusement park that's hosting, <coughs> is where we're set up. Uh, they are getting in on the action as well because they actually play music through their PA system that is holiday appropriate. I am so grateful because I've, we've all been in the Spirit Halloween store and they're just playing the regular radio. This place, they're playing uh, Monster Mash, music from Alfred Hitchcock, Dawn of the Dead, Halloween. Purple People Eater, People everything. Eater, Witch Doctor, uh, all this stuff. Thriller, uh, Zombie, uh, it's all getting played. And it, it just, it's kind of cool. Uh, what's been really fun for me is when they play something from a film, like Halloween or something, and my coworker in the ticket booth, she looks up and she's like, "What? What is this? Like, that's my jam. That's what it is." So that that's been cool. And then, yeah, it's all it's all really neat. Um, uh, for those of you who did not listen to the previous episode that Beth was on, there are three individual haunts. Grimthorn Manor, which now is even more special to us. It's the one that Beth designs and manages. Uh, the Complex, which is basically an asylum gone horribly wrong. And Silver Scream, where you're going to get chased by 80s and 90s, 90s slasher movies that have come to life. Um, did I tell you about the Leatherface and the, the little African-American boy? No! So, last Sunday night, I was waiting for you to get done. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some of the walk-around characters are still walking around, mm-hmm. Leatherface being one of them. And whoever's playing Leatherface has watched Texas Chainsaw Massacre and has the movements down. But he put the chainsaw over his head and kind of danced back and forth. He's got that little shimmy down. So he was doing that while he's walking around the park at night. And this little boy, maybe about nine years old, is like, hey, mister, hey, mister. He's trailing maybe 10, 15 feet behind him. Are you Okay. Are you okay? Because he's still you know, Leatherface is screaming and walking kind of funny. Finally, he gets up to Leatherface. Leatherface <laughs> turns on him, raises the chainsaw, and does his little dance. Vroom! The kid took off like a <laughs> dead man. And like, dude, that was that was awesome. Uh, that Leatherface this year is actually played by our, by Scareground's own Justin McLeod. He has about 10 years of haunt experience, and for at least five of those, we've had a chainsaw in his hands one way or another a, a variety of times. Yes, if, if, if we ever have an Evil Dead haunt, I know right where I'm putting him. There is no question. Oh, yes. Speaking of which, if viewers have ideas for haunts that you would like to see, favorite scary movies, favorite scary stories, um, a piece of artwork, anything can inspire a haunt. And we are starting, we literally had a meeting backstage tonight to start brainstorming ideas for next year's haunt. So we are not even waiting until Halloween to start for 2023. We're, we are already planning for you guys. And I'd be happy if anyone wants to leave ideas in the comments to pass those on. In the comments, uh, in the, the email, shoot me an email, monsterkidradio at gmail.com. I don't remember what the link is off the top of my head, but I will make sure there's a link in the show notes. If you are in the area and you want to come, I'll save you $2 because I have a code that was given to me by Scaregrounds for listeners of Monster Kid Radio. You just have to pay for your tickets ahead of time, but you'll get in $2 cheaper. Uh, It's Depending on which night you come, it is anywhere from $28, $23 depending on what time, to uh, $33. Uh, for all three haunts, and I think it's well worth it. I don't know what else to say other than uh, I am in total love with this woman <laughs> in my car right now. I'm so glad she said yes. I had a feeling she would. But uh, I've, I've heard more laugh out of you than I have in a long time, and it's a particular kind of laugh I don't think I've ever heard. I love it. It's a happy laugh. It's just a genuinely happy laugh. And I'm so excited to have you join the Scare Jones family and me join the Monster Kid Radio family and merge all of our spookiness forever. 
Oh yeah, you are no longer my spooky girlfriend. <laughs> you are my spooky fiance and soon you'll be my spooky wife. Hell yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Okay, that brings us to the end of this episode of Monster Kid Radio. Thank you for listening. Big thanks to Mark for really saving the show this week with that epic Monster Bash recap. So thank you for that. And of course, thank you to him as well for the Beta Capsule Review, to Kenny for the Famous Monsters of Film Land segment, and to Captain Billy for the uh, voicemail that he sent in. If you want to be part of the show and have any comments about anything that you've heard about this week on the show or in the previous 594 episodes, you can email me at monsterkidradio at gmail.com or shoot me a voicemail. Drop me a voicemail. Send me a voicemail. That's the word at 360-524-2400. Eight, four. Of course, this is all available on our website at monsterkidradio.net, where you're going to find links to our Twitter page, our Facebook page, our Facebook group, our Discord, our Reddit, our Patreon, and everything else that we've got going on. Plus, if you go to our website, you will find the secret code to help you save $2 if you go to Scaregrounds PDX. Uh, to their website to buy tickets. If you go to their website to buy tickets, use the code MONSTERKIDSAVES. That's all one word. Or just go straight to tinyurl.com slash mkrscaregrounds. You'll save $2 on your ticket. It's a great time. We have so much fun out there. And I'm just in the ticket booth. I'm having a good time. I can't imagine the kind of fun that they're having down at the haunted houses themselves. So please head on down if you're in the area. And I'm the only dude in the ticket booth. Say hi. I'd love to meet you. What's coming up next week on the show? I'm not 100% sure yet because, like I said, we're still dealing with computer issues. I do want to have filmmaker Sebastian Gadain on the show. He is in the middle of a fundraising campaign for his upcoming movie. Uh, and I would love to talk to him about that. He's been posting on Facebook various films that he's been using as inspiration for this particular movie, and they're all Monster Kid movies, movies in our wheelhouse. There's a Lovecraftian flavor to it, too, so you know I want to talk to him about that. Plus... I'm really hoping to turn the rest of November into price giving. We're going to look at some Vincent Price films. And tentatively, I've got Chris, Dominique, Beth, Scott, and Tracy all potentially in the mix for that. So stay tuned for that, okay? All right. Uh, If this episode does go out before the weekend, I need to let you know I am so sorry. There's a really good chance there will be no stream because, again, the computer is MIA. So we probably won't be getting to that. I'm hoping we can. But, you know, I'm keeping my fingers and tentacles crossed. That's about all I can say. In the meantime, though, I hope you have an amazing Halloween. You know, if nothing else, if I can get the computer before Halloween day, maybe I'll throw up some movies on Halloween day so you can have a little bit of monster kid movie club fun on the day itself. Again, fingers, tentacles crossed, all right? In the meantime, though, remember that Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, (gasps) 3.0 unported license. My name is Derek M. Cook, and if you don't hear from me again until, well, next month, happy Halloween. Ciao.